I'm a mother of two. Toby is four and likes Lego and jumping off things. And my daughter Mia is six and likes warm baths, horse riding and hugs. When my daughter dies, I will wash her and dress her. I will put flowers in her hair. We will play music, light candles, and hold her. Our family and friends will come to say their goodbyes. I've just given you a tiny glimpse into the weird universe you find yourself living in when you're a parent with a dying child. The crazy things you have to contemplate when you are facing your worst fear every day. I've been forced to think about this, but I also have an ability to be able to see hope when life feels pretty hopeless. Living in grief means life is more illuminating. It makes me recognize the goodness in people and appreciate the privileges I do have. The power of joy, love and kindness gives me a sense of hope. Flowers from a neighbour or hugs from complete strangers, it's been such a powerful and unexpected force. Before her diagnosis, Mia had been running around, scooting, singing songs and starting to count. She was a healthy, energetic, affectionate baby and toddler. And at three years old, she'd even mastered the art of bossing us all around, especially her younger brother, Toby. But Mia's behaviour changed. Aggressive outbursts, lashing out at her brother, pulling things off the walls. At first, we just thought we were really bad at this parenting gig and vowed to be more consistent with boundaries and bedtimes. And then out of the blue, Mia had a seizure. Doctors at first diagnosed her with epilepsy. But the seizures got worse. Over the next few months, Mia started falling down and hitting her head so much, we had to fit her out with a little rugby helmet. And then suddenly, she was struggling to walk and talk. We were living in Singapore at the time, and it got to the point where we'd gone through a whole team of specialists working with Mia, and they seemed just as confused as we were. So we decided to fly home to Sydney for a second opinion. There is no preparation for being told your child has no future. Hamish and I were sitting next to Mia's bed in the Sydney Children's Hospital in Randwick, and Mia was sedated, sleeping from her latest test checking for signs of degeneration in her eyesight. We had been warned that if Mia tested positive, the outlook was bleak. The neurologist walked into the room with an entourage of specialists and social workers and confirmed our worst fears. Mia has neuronal ceroid lupificinosis, or late infantile Batten disease, a very rare genetic neurodegenerative condition that affects less than one in 100,000 children. It is fatal. The doctor said to us, we're talking about years, not decades. Mia probably won't make it to high school. A young doctor on the team started crying, but we were so numb, so exhausted, we couldn't cry, not then. It had been a really long day, a long week, a long year. I crawled onto the bed with Mia and closed my eyes and held her. Her warm little body comforted me. Mia had reached a point where soon she would no longer be able to walk or talk. And we knew that within a year or two, she was going to deteriorate to the point where she would be blind, dependent on us for all her needs, and we would start feeding her via a tube. The breakthroughs in enzyme and gene therapy are too late for our daughter. So giving up the fight for her life 
has been replaced with giving her the best life. Friends and family rallied around us and supported us. They held a fundraiser for Mia. Their generosity and kindness was pivotal in our response and ability to cope. They encouraged me to set up a social media campaign, Bounce for Baton, which has since gone on to achieve more than I ever imagined in raising awareness of this rare disease. Mia loved bouncing. It is positive, it resonates, and it connects people. The awareness is not going to change the path ahead for Mia. But we want people to know about Batten disease, to support research, and see the meaning in Mia's life and all children affected by life-limiting conditions. The Bounce for Batten images have been described as portraits of joy and they share a powerful story of love and support amidst the hopelessness of a young child dying. Our reality has given me clarity to hone in on what really matters. So, we ignored all the well-meaning advice about no big decisions in a crisis. Within a week, Hamish had quit his job, and we started packing to go home to Sydney. We knew we needed to be back in Australia, surrounded by family. We were just your ordinary family, with no expertise in healthcare, disability, or rare disease, trying to find our way in the chaos of caring, grieving, advocating, and raising a young family. Coming back to Australia was a big reality check. Mia's health deteriorated quickly to the point she needed a wheelchair. The excruciating wait list, the endless appointment, the piles of paperwork, and those fucking Centrelink forms that... <laughs> no one on earth knows how to fill out properly. We lost precious time being stonewalled by local childcare centres and schools. We couldn't throw money at the problem because private schools across the board just don't do high-needs kids. But I hadn't brought my child home to be isolated. In her first school, a small special-needs school, where she was left in soiled nappies, and the staff referred to children as walkers or chairs, we felt disconnected and hidden away. I pulled Mia out of that school with no school to go to. The Department of Education suggest, suggested homeschooling to us, the exact opposite of what we needed. Hamish and I had made a promise to ourselves that we would give Mia the most wonderful life possible in the time she had left. There's a public primary school just around the corner from our house. I'd walked past it often and wondered. From the moment we walked into that school, it just felt like we'd finally come home. The bright paintings plastered all over the classrooms, the singing and all those smiling faces. Nothing was too hard for the principal, no problem too big. He was empathetic. He asked us about our hopes and dreams. We waited a few months for the ramps to be built, and Mia started school there at the end of last year. Being included in a big school community has transformed our lives. It is everything we craved. It gave us hope we could give Mia a regular childhood, as regular as it can be. Mia has shown me the most tender and giving elements of the human spirit. I'm immensely proud our daughter teaches kindness, empathy, and acceptance. They are beautiful qualities to foster in our children. At school, kids hold Mia's, Mia's hand. They prop her head back up on a headrest when it falls off, they read to her, they stand by her side, and they laugh with her. We've made new friendships that we hope will last and sustain us beyond Mia's lifetime. I find beautiful drawings and cards in Mia's bag most afternoons. I love you. You're better than rainbows. <laughs> we are best friends. And on the weekends, we go to birthday parties and playdates. Mia has a powerful ability to connect with people. She can't see or talk, 
She can't move independently, but she makes an impact. And being witness every day to the beauty of humanity is a privilege for me. People smile, reach out, offer to help, and show us incredible kindness. I have a new perspective to be able to recognise and appreciate these small, but not inconsequential, human elements of connection. I've been kissed by a stranger on the cheek in a doctor's waiting room. I've hugged and cried together with mums in the park I've only just met. I've listened to a nurse tell me about her experience of losing her children and seen the bare-faced exhaustion, love and fear on faces in paediatric wards and at the children's hospice we attend. Within our communities, both virtually and locally, we experience deeper connections and love we would never have known if Mia wasn't dying. Perhaps, in our situation, it is just simply a desperate need to do something when you are so powerless. You really will do the craziest things when you think it might just help. Before Mia's diagnosis, we were told the chance of our son having the CLN2 Batten disease mutation was one in four. Thankfully, he isn't affected. But our healthy four-year-old can't but help have some pretty weird ideas about what growing up looks like. Hanging out in the kitchen recently, Toby pipes up, will my teeth go wobbly and fall out? Probably when you're about five or six, like Mia. Will I still be able to walk when I'm five? We try to be honest with Toby to help prepare him for the day when his big sister won't be with us anymore physically. My six-year-old can't hug me anymore. Her seizures are constant. But she loves the feel of water and riding a horse each week, and she can't get enough of our hugs. The present moment is the only place where I want to be right now. I've been forced to live here, and letting go of tomorrow, next week, next month, allows me to focus on what really matters right now. Life is more vivid, more beautiful, more profound and meaningful, and of course, unspeakably sad. I have come to accept that there is no cure for my daughter. One day, I will no longer have her warm little body to snuggle up with at night. So when I put flowers in her hair and friends and family come to say goodbye, I will remember the human capacity for hope is so strong that even when you're told there is no hope, somehow, you still manage to find it. Thank you. <laughs>